Hello there! Welcome to the Saroy channel. Wherever you are in the world and so much love to each and every one of you. I hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much. And I'm so delighted that you've joined me tonight for another fabulous story which you're absolutely going to love. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners. Mrs Bromaway, are you there? came the voice. I was shaking violently as I clutched my cell phone in my hands, holding it tightly to my chest, so much so that my fingers began to ache and perspiration broke out feverishly on my palms. The cell that I was holding became slippery in my fingers, as if I was manually holding a block of butter that was beginning to melt in my hands. I had the speakerphone on. Mrs. Bramaway, came the voice again. Can you hear me? Hello? 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 Mrs. Bromaway, can you hear me? Are you still there, Mrs. Bromaway? I could hear the man clearly. Of course I could. His deep baritone voice expressed concern. I could hear him speaking to someone in the background. His wife, I suspected. I don't know if I've lost the connection with her or not. I can't hear a thing. There's no clicking sound that you would expect to hear when a call finishes. Do you think I should disconnect this call? Try phoning her back, perhaps. Sweetheart, I'm sure she's still there. She's probably in shock after what you've told her, came a woman's gentle voice. Just remain patiently on the line with her. I'm sure the poor lady is digesting the news. Just be a little patient, will you? That's the problem. I'm not sure she still is there, said the man, sighing with exasperation. It might just be a dodgy connection. Do you think I should try again? Maybe she dropped the phone out of her hands or something. People do that a lot when they've had a nasty shock. Should I call her again? What should I do? I would hold on a little longer if I were you, the woman encouraged. Just give her a chance to speak. Hello, repeated the male voice. Are you still there, Mrs. Bromaway? Can you hear me? If you can, please speak up for me, because I can't hear you at all. I'm worried this is a dodgy line or something, but it's very important that I speak with you. There is stuff we need to discuss. I've been trying to get hold of you for several days now. I know what I've just told you is devastating, and you have our deepest sympathy, Mrs. Bromaway, but it's critical that we talk. Tears spilled down my cheeks unabashedly. It was as if the floodgates of my grief were beginning to open up, almost as if sandbags on a river bank would be not enough to block the overflow. Yet despite this, I made no obvious noise. My tears remained stiffly silent. There was no blubbering or sniffing on my part. I was frozen in place, like a statue at an extravagant banquet that was incompetently disabled from expressing my despair, as if it was all locked away inside of me. But the cracks and the ice were beginning to show, and slowly but surely the ice started to melt. I couldn't believe this was actually happening, especially not to me. This was the sort of thing that played itself out in the movies, not in ordinary people's lives. I must be dreaming. Of course that's what this was about. I was probably lying blissfully fast asleep in my bed, in the upstairs bedroom, next to my husband Freddy. At this moment I was entangled in a gruesome nightmare, rather like a fly caught up in the silken fibres of a spider web, trying to wrestle its way out. But I was about to wake up in any second. I would soon laugh at myself for the futility of it all. Honestly, what was I like? I'd likely say to my husband Freddy, "'You'll never believe what I dreamed last night!' It was so lucidly real. Freddy would regard me enviously. It's not fair. Why do you always have such graphic dreams, Jamie? Why doesn't that happen to me? Do you realise how lucky you are to dream so vividly? Why on earth are you complaining about it? I can't even remember my dreams. Think about it for a moment. At least you get entertained while you sleep. Me, all I get is a blank, very bland, uninspiring canvas. In my head, like you see in an artist's studio. One that hasn't been christened with any paint yet. Me? No, I never dream. Believe me, I'd likely say. 
You wouldn't have enjoyed this dream one bit. In truth, it wasn't a dream at all. It was a horrible, horrible graphic nightmare. A gruesome one at that, about my father. But boy, I'm glad it was spurious. That's too bad, he would lightly say sympathetically. But at least you know, Jamie, that your dream wasn't real. But I still say that you're better off than someone like myself, who doesn't dream at all. Even if sometimes your dreams are a tad ominous. It's all entertainment in my book. And good or bad, you're better off than if you don't dream at all. Trust me, I'd insist, as I had done so many times before. Everybody dreams. I guarantee you that. In fact, I know you dream. If I do, it must be so riveting, Freddy would say, with a scathing sarcasm, accompanied by a humorous twinkle in his eye at the very same time. Because I never remember them. But that's normal, I would assure him. A lot of people have absolutely no memory of their dreams. In fact, if the truth be told, I don't remember most of mine. There was no point in arguing with Freddy over this matter, because it was a battle I would never win. He was convinced he had never dreamed a day in his life. He put this odd peculiarity down to having no imagination. As far as he was concerned, it was only creative, visionary people who dreamed, like artists, poets, architects and writers alike. But a man as methodical as he was, he thought was incapable of dreaming. My husband was scientific, mathematical, a fact-based man, driven by the things he saw and observed with the naked eye, and the specimens he scrutinised every week, under the slide of his microscope, in the medical laboratory where he worked, in an environment where diagnoses, sometimes of the very worst kind, were made, but very often the news was good, when the specimens he received were both benign and non-malignant. My husband had never indulged himself in spurial, whimsical fantasies, and regretfully had never enjoyed the escapism of reading a fictional book, a day in his life, which I think would have done him a world of good, but he wasn't wired to be that way. When he was an eight-year-old boy, he found his grandfather's Encyclopedia Britannica collection and read those giant-sized books from the beginning to end, like a selection of Nancy Drew novels. I mean, who in their right mind does that? It was a long-standing joke in his family, who found it heartily amusing that an eight-year-old kid, who should be out and about, buoyantly playing with his friends and doing what other eight-year-old boys typically do, would be reading the encyclopedia. Freddy incongruously had taken it upon himself to read all this fact-based literature from start to finish, with the same kind of gripping enthusiasm some kids might direct towards reading Harry Potter. Indeed, his grandmother Doris had confided in me about Freddy when he was a little boy. She chuckled as she looked back on his childhood with a great deal of matriarchal affection. Your Freddy, when he was eight, was completely consumed by those Encyclopedia Britannicas, she told me. She cocked her head of silvery curls to one side and let out an amused chuckle that made me smile. To think that my husband so nearly threw those encyclopedias away. We bought them from a door-to-door -door salesman in the 1980s who persuaded us that the Encyclopedia Britannica would quite literally change our lives. It would revolutionise us, he told us. It did not. We barely gave them any reference, you know. That was what you did in those days, you see, when Google was not easily at your disposal. Either that or visit a library to satisfy your hunger for knowledge, or to look up some facts. I remember my daughter Simone, your husband's mother, was doing a project on golden eagles. We had to take out books in the library to find out about the subject. Today it's just one click onto Google and you get everything you can possibly need. How times have changed since then. Alas, those Encyclopedia Britannicas that set us back a lot of money. Well, they turned out to be useful, didn't they? They sat there on the bookshelf in my husband's study for years, uselessly gathering dust, until, of course, little Freddy came along, like a breath of fresh air to change all that. So maybe those encyclopedias weren't such a redundant purchase after all that.
They brought our little Freddy countless hours of entertainment. When my husband told little Freddy that he could have those old encyclopedias to keep, he looked like all his Christmases had come at once, as if we'd brought him an expensive train set or something. He was absolutely thrilled. His eyes lit up like a Christmas tree. He told my husband that he was the best grandfather in the entire world for being so generous with all his old books that I have to say he would have gladly taken to the dump. I mean, how many eight-year-old boys would say that to their grandfather if he gave them a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas as a gift? Conversely, they'd probably burst into tears from bitter disappointment for being given what they would likely consider to be a hideously repugnant present. Not Freddy. Never Freddy. He was always hungry for knowledge. He had this insatiable appetite for it, asking questions all the time, collecting interesting specimens of insects in glass jars, and studying them for hours on end. I do remember he thoroughly enjoyed growing all kinds of interesting, rather colourful moulds in Petri dishes. Freddy was an idiosyncratic child. I'd never seen such a young child that wanted to know absolutely everything. He loved those encyclopedias, read them until they were literally falling apart like an old Bible that you've read far too many times. My husband said to me one day, You mark my words, Doris. That grandson of ours is as bright as a button and as sharp as a hawk. One of these days he's going to be a scientist, and it seems he wasn't wrong. When Freddy was at school, his science teacher was in awe of how bright he was, always initiating the experiments in the classroom. One time, I understand, he actually caused a major explosion in the laboratory, shattering a glass window when he was young. But the less said about that, the better, I think. I knew my husband's grandmother was right. She had summed up Freddy in a nutshell. Freddy loved facts like you or I might enjoy a good movie on a Saturday night. But that was my husband for you. And although he was now about 30 years old, not much had changed in that regard, as he was still consumed by facts, which was why he loved his job, working in a laboratory as a pathologist. Let me assure you, if me and my husband were sitting in front of the television, watching a quiz show, he almost always knew the answers to all the questions. But given he'd read many encyclopedias when he was young and had the memory of an elephant, was that any surprise that he knew the answers? I don't think so. I would never have expected anything less from my husband. He knew some things that many of us would never even want to know. His sprawling knowledge was nothing short of impressive, even if some things he knew were probably rather useless in the grand scheme of things. But my husband, he loved it all. Many people thought he should have gone on that quiz show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Freddy was camera shy. He loathed any kind of public attention being directed at him. So that would never have happened. The truth was in my heart, as I stood there in my all-white glossy kitchen, with its pretty view over the front yard of our home in Nevada, where all the flat-roofed terracotta-coloured houses not only looked much the same, but were close together, in a built-up neighbourhood scattered liberally with towering palm trees. I was clutching my cell phone so tightly in my hand that my knuckles had turned white. My bare feet on the white marble kitchen floor felt cold to the touch, even though it was quite warm. It would seem a chill crept through my cotton pyjamas that did not just come from the cold but the freezing abominable revelations of the caller that had turned my blood into ice. I knew this was no dream. I was staring at the coffee I'd recently made. The mug was on the kitchen countertop, and the billowing steam was rising up above the dark concoction, and there was nothing illusory about this dose of reality, as the caramelised nutty smell of the coffee was incredibly pronounced. Hello, came the voice of the caller again. If you are there, Mrs. Bromaway, please answer me, or I'm afraid I'm going to disconnect this call and try phoning you again. It's important I speak with you, Mrs. Bromaway. There are things that need to be discussed. I know this is very upsetting news, and I'm grievously sorry for your loss. I knew I needed to reply before the caller disconnected our call. 
but there was a great big lump developing at the back of my throat, growing so big it was actually almost blocking my airways, so much so that I was almost choking. I managed to make some kind of absurd squeaking sound at the end of the phone, like a yes that sounded more like an injured animal that was crying out in pain but at least it reassured the man that I was still at the end of the line. He sounded heartily relieved to hear my tormented bleats. Oh, I'm so pleased, Mrs. Bromaway, that you're still there. I thought I'd lost you. Thank you for staying on the line. I know this must be very disconcerting for you, Mrs. Bromaway. There are no words. Me and my wife, we're still trying to get our heads around this, and we... Sorry, I said, interrupting the man's smooth flow. "'Could you just repeat everything you've just told me again, from the very beginning?' "'I'm not sure why I asked him to do this, "'but perhaps I was trying to reassure myself "'that what he'd told me was a floundering miscommunication "'that I'd misheard, or somehow I'd got my wires crossed, "'so that maybe if he said it all over again, "'it would now be a new script, "'and the old narrative would have been flushed away, "'like a theatre producer telling the actors on the stage "'that the dialogue has been redrafted.' and the story subsequently changed. You want me to repeat everything I've just told you, Mrs. Bromaway? Yes, please, if you could. I'm not sure I heard you right in the very beginning. Everything you said, well, it flew over me. Well, that's understandable in the circumstances, Mrs. Bromaway, said the man, clearing his throat. He sounded uncomfortable, as if the last thing in the world he wanted to do was to recount what he'd told me only moments before. It was hard to explain, but I needed to hear absolutely everything again, every detail. It was important for me to assimilate his paradoxical, anomalous words, to make some kind of sense over what he was telling me. I braced myself for the impact of his dismaying revelations, as if a grenade had been flung at me through the kitchen window, and I needed to duck down for cover. My whole body was compacted with a compressed angst, almost as if I was wearing an 1800s corset, that had been pulled in so tightly with unforgiving ribbons that rudely, with a merciless forcefulness, expunged all my breath away. I privately told myself to hold it together. I could crumble and fall apart after the call had ended, but now I needed to listen to what this man had to say. I needed to pay attention. All I wanted to do was to scream so loudly that even the glasses from the previous night that were drying upside down on the side of the sink would shatter from the vibration. I needed to establish all the details of what had actually happened to my father. I was clandestinely hoping that none of this was true. I drew in a deep breath that was so painful, as if I was drawing up oxygen that was contaminated with a vile, repungent, thick, sludgy black soot that was poisoning my lungs. I told myself to try and be as dispassionate as possible as I listened to the caller. Otherwise his words would float past me, like a balloon on the wind, and I couldn't let that happen, as grasping every detail was of paramount importance, so falling apart was not an option for me. I knew, of course, that people often held it together, when caught up in the grip of a tumultuous, life-threatening situation, saliently extracting their family and animals from a burning building, perhaps. Indeed, people in the midst of any kind of gripping disaster did often remain calm and stoic, reigning in their panic to get everyone to safety. In the same breath, even though of course the circumstances for me were entirely different, I knew I would be wise to do the same, as a methodology made perfect sense to me. As I was saying, Mrs. Bromaway, there is no easy way to say this, but as I informed you earlier on, your father has tragically passed away in less than favourable circumstances. Me and my wife Peggy are incredibly sorry for your tragic loss. We send you our condolences and deepest sympathies. If there's anything we can do in regards to the matter, we would gladly help. We will always be here for you, Mrs. Bromaway, as any friend of your father's is a friend of ours. Your father was a very good man. He had a hard life of that, I know. Things were not always terribly easy for him. But one thing me and my wife, Peggy, know, Mrs. Bromaway, was that you were the apple of his eye. He talked about you with great fondness and affection. Graham certainly didn't deserve any of this to happen to him. 
But sometimes bad things happen to good people, Mrs. Bromaway. I've never understood this enigmatic conundrum, which is why so often I've had issues with my Christian faith. Sometimes a divine justice that some people call karma seems to be sorely missing in our world. Let's just say when you see evil thrive, you wonder where God is amidst all the chaos and discord. My Peggy believes that good in the end will always triumph over evil. I try to hold on to this, Mrs. Bromaway. Otherwise, none of this makes any sense to me at all. No, it can't be, I cried out. No, you're lying, you've got to be. This can't be true. You're wrong. My dad isn't dead, he's not dead. Why are you cruelly making all this up? Why? Why are you doing this? Regretfully, Mrs. Bromaway, I wish I was making this up. I am afraid your father is deceased, and I can't imagine how grievous your loss must be. But I don't understand, I blubbered. How can this be? What happened? What happened to him? That's a very good question, Mrs. Bromaway, of which I wish I knew the answers to. We do not know what exactly happened to your father. The coroner has never seen anything like it before in his entire life. And I don't say that with any exaggeration. We would have contacted you sooner, of course, but we did not know your contact details. We searched your father's house from top to bottom, trying to find them. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack, let me tell you. Luckily, my wife Peggy found your cell phone number in an old notebook. We had initially disregarded and overlooked. It was gathering dust in the hall table. And that was our salvation. Your mother's number was in the book as well. So we contacted her. I understand you and your father have not spoken to her for many years. But Peggy felt it was significantly important for her to learn of your father's passing. It didn't seem right not to inform her. I hope we did the right thing there in telling her. And that we haven't caused you greater upset. He said gingerly. I squirmed as the caller mentioned my mother's name. The perfidious double-crossing woman I'd loved to hate for the last several years of my life, for she had hurt my father so badly with her traitorous behaviour that I'd found impossible to forgive. I cut her out of my life with a razor-sharp efficiency, and if I had never seen her again, it would have been too soon. My disloyal, fickle mother had cheated on my father with her personal trainer. They had sauntered off into the sunset together, to live happily ever after, once my father had given her the divorce she had demanded. I'd never spoken or seen her since, and I didn't want to either. I'd always been close to my father, so his hurt became my own. My mother's disgusting betrayal towards my dad was also a breach of faith towards me, as far as I was concerned. My feelings towards her were less than complimentary. I had wantonly cut all communication off with her, but I suppose the caller was right. I thought rather begrudgingly. It was probably only courtesy polite to tell her about my father's demise, as she was married to him at one point, and it wasn't right to keep this news from her. Well, rather you than me, you're right. You probably did have to tell her, even though I would rather she was kept in the dark. That's what we thought, said the man, sounding heartily relieved. I'm very glad you feel that way, Mrs. Bromaway. We were significantly worried. We know your relationship with your mother is fractured. We needed to find that notebook of your father's, you see. Or we'd have been in a right quandary. Your father's cell phone with all the contact details was useless to us. We found it completely smashed up under the old oak tree in the front yard. I hasten to say it was as dead as he was. So we had no way of contacting you at all. So thank goodness my wife's ingenuity saved the day. This is where things get unpalatable, rather grisly, Mrs. Bromaway. So I hope you've got a strong cast-iron stomach, because I'm afraid you're going to need one. What I'm going to tell you next is not easy listening, and will not rest comfortably with you. The caller took in a deep breath and was hesitant for a moment, and then he spoke again. Your dad's deceased corpse was ripped apart, I'm afraid. His innards, entrails and internal organs 
were torn up violently from a badly lacerated body. They were lying indiscriminately and haphazardly, dangling across the branches of the old oak tree in the yard. His legs had been wrenched off his torso, as were his arms. It was like they'd been yanked off him with a brute, unforgivable force. Every part of his scratched-up body was grotesquely displayed, like tinsel on a Christmas tree. It was the most appalling barbaric sight I have ever seen in my entire life, like something out of the most abysmal crime scene drama that has been perpetrated by a psychopath. It just didn't seem real. It was so, so... The caller appeared to be looking for words. So ghoulishly macabre, he finally settled. Never seen anything like it before. As I was saying, Mrs. Bromaway, never. There are no words. It was repellently gruesome. I'm still suffering from PTSD from the experience and had to get some tranquilizers from the doctor, as did my wife. A right state we were both in. I couldn't stomach my food for many days after your father's demise. This has hit us grievously hard. You don't unsee something like that. You never forget it. Even the crime scene police who isolated the area at once, initially assuming a brutal murder had been perpetrated by a deranged nut job, as based on first appearances, some insane unhinged maniac was obviously responsible for harming your father. So they arrived at the scene looking more than a little bewildered and discomposed, especially when they witnessed the stark reality of what had happened to him. One of the men, dressed in white plastics, was violently sick, throwing up the contents of his stomach over everything. And he is, I am sure, one of those people that's attended a lot of crime scenes before. And so this might give you some perspective of just how gruesome your father's death really was. Me and Peggy couldn't believe that such a vile atrocity had been committed against such a nice, decent man like Graham. Mrs. Bronaway, I hasten to say I've seen ugly stuff in my life. Too much for a man that's approaching his forties like myself to have to see. It's made me old before my time. I fought in Afghanistan in 2001, when the United States waged war with Al-Qaeda. So I've single-handedly seen the cruel brutality of what war brings. But the less said about that, the better. What happened to your father was completely horrific. I don't know how to tell you this, Mrs. Bromaway, as it's rarely going to upset you. But I believe you need to hear the truth. You see, I always promised your father when he was alive that should anything untoward happen to him, and he should suddenly die unexpectedly in unforeseen circumstances, that I would get in touch with you to tell you the news. He didn't want a policeman to have to come to your front door, as you can appreciate. He thought that would be tough on you. He wanted you to hear everything from a friend that knew him well, to soften the blow. I wonder if he had a prognostic sense of something bad going to happen to him sort of thing. He asked me to do this for him not too long ago, I might add. About six months ago, to be precise. It can only make you wonder... So in the harrowing circumstances, it was decided I should be the one to contact you. Mrs. Bromaway, just so you know, I've been your father's next-door neighbour for many years, ten years to be precise. We both live on sizable plots of lands here in Montana. I'm your father's closest neighbour. I understand you've been meaning to visit him. I know he was hoping that this Thanksgiving and Christmas you and your husband Freddy would come up and stay with him, and not the other way round, which is what usually happens. He comes and stays with you in Nevada for three weeks a year, I'm told. But this time it was going to be different. We were all looking forward to it. My wife Peggy was going to create a marvellous feast for the all of us this Thanksgiving. Pull out all the stops, so to speak. It was going to be wonderful, a gathering of note, an opportunity for me and Peggy to get to know the both of you. And then this has to happen, to throw a spanner in the works. Your father talked about you all the time, Mrs. Bromaway. You have no idea. Anyway, he was very proud of you, he was. 
Me and Peggy were looking very forward to meeting you. Too bad it's going to be now in less auspicious circumstances, as you're going to need to come up to Montana. But the invitation for Thanksgiving still stands this year. We could have a memorial kind of get-together for your father. That's so kind of you. It sounds like a fabulous idea to have Thanksgiving together to honour my dad's memory. Me and Freddy were looking forward to coming to Montana for Christmas this year. And Thanksgiving, of course, to stay with Dad. We were eager to see his cottage. I've never actually been to the place before. But Dad told me all about it. I know my father loved his new home. When I was little, my father loved taking the family to Yellowstone National Park. He fell passionately in love with Montana. It was after my parents' ugly divorce that he wanted to heal his broken heart. So he decided to move to Montana, as the wild, rugged and natural landscape was very cathartic for him. My mother cheated on him, you see, with her personal trainer. But then I'm sure, as his good friend, you know all about that already. When my mother told him she was in love with someone else, that just tore my father apart. I couldn't believe her callous, cold-hearted cruelty, and the vindictive, insouciant way she threw him to the curb, spitting him out like old tobacco, because she thought she'd found someone better. It made me sick to my stomach, it did. You couldn't get a kinder, more caring man than my father. I never spoke to her again after that. I was so disgusted with her behaviour, and the way she wantonly abandoned my father. I hated her for that, as you can imagine. That's why I haven't spoken to her in years, and now you've been in contact with her. I know all about that. Let's just say I could see your father was in a bad way, Mrs. Bromaway, when I first went around to his cottage to introduce myself to him as his new neighbour. He was in a sorry state, rather reclusive, underweight, thin and emaciated, very withdrawn, but Peggy soon put an end to his reserved, rather demure inhibitions. We got some flesh on his bones and brought him out of his shell. My Peggy can do that. She's got quite the way with people, you see. Marvellous woman she is. But you'll find that out when you meet her shortly. People talk to my Peggy, confide in her. She's especially good at keeping secrets, so people trust her. She used to be a social worker. So yes, your father talked to her a great deal, shared his heart with her, told her stuff I don't even know about. We would invite your father over to our place regularly. My Peggy doesn't like anyone to be out on their own. So we became close friends over the years. More like family, really. Your father reminded Peggy of her own dad that she lost to cancer. So she was very fond of him. So yes, we've taken his death rather badly. It's far too close to home as well. There is more that I haven't told you, of course, concerning your father's demise. Unless you want me to spare you the details, Mrs. Bronaway. It might be easier that way for you. In my opinion, some things are just not worth hearing. And it isn't necessary for you to know absolutely everything if you don't want to. And that's perfectly understandable in the circumstances. There's more. You haven't told me everything yet. I must know everything. I have to know everything. I insisted. This is my father we're talking about. I need to know what happened to him. Don't spare me any of the details out of politeness, even if they are repellent. That's what I thought you would say, Mrs. Bronaway. I'm much the same. I'd feel the same if something happened to a loved one of mine. I would want to know all the details, no matter how gruesome they were. I'm afraid, Mrs. Bromaway. I need to warn you, this is not going to be easy to hear. Worse than what I just previously told you. Even my wife is shaking her head as I speak to you now. She is silently begging me not to tell you this. She's worried it's going to upset you. But I know you need to hear it. If you're anything like myself, which I feel you most certainly are. Your father's head, Mrs. Bronaway, had been plucked off his neck, was placed very strategically on the front doorstep, on the doormat, so that it would be found... I'm afraid his eyes were mercilessly gouged out, so the sockets were empty. His death looked like a vengeful, malicious, acrimonious killing, Mrs. Bromaway, as if someone wanted him dead, and was eager to make his end very conspicuous. 
almost like a cautionary warning to others, you could say, as if whoever killed your father was saying, don't mess with me or this will happen to you, if you get my drift. That was certainly the feeling I got from the scene, Mrs. Bromaway. I was the unfortunate one to stumble upon the gruesome sight, as we were expecting your father for dinner that evening, and he never appeared, which was most unlike him. Your father would have phoned us if he had wanted to take a rain check on the evening. Your father was courteous that way. I instinctively knew something was terribly wrong. Call it a hunch if you like. I went out to check on him, and that was when I discovered his decapitated head on the doorstep. I was so shocked I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I hastened to say I actually passed out for a while, and came to. And I've got a rock-hard stomach, Mrs. Bromaway. But this, this was hideous. I need you to know that the coroner, let's get back to the coroner, shall we, does not believe a human being was responsible for doing this to your father, which means there's going to be no further investigation in regard to the matter. Your father's death was not deemed suspicious. The police seem all too eager to brush it under the carpet, as if it never happened. The mind just boggles. I do know there were strange scratches all over the body. The flesh was torn up, gouged out by what looked like huge claw marks. There were bite marks all over the body. The coroner insists they are of a canine origin. I saw them myself. I gather short hairs that were very dark were found all over his body. They also look to be canine under the microscope. Like some kind of wolf species, I believe. But let me tell you this, Mrs. Bromaway. A wolf could not have done this to your father. Whatever did this to him was a monster. So there we are. That's the end of part one. Part two is tomorrow night. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.